Hi. <laughs> Hi. Bro, you know that talk. You know that talk. You said, can they hear me? <laughs> understand your grandbabies need those tickets different uh, parts of the world and if you can hear me loud and clear i do this all the time you want to turn your cameras on and then wave your right hand so that i know you can hear me loud and clear Okay, so I see many of you waving your hands. Some of you still don't have your camera, so either maybe you don't have the camera on your laptop. Okay, so I see the, the future generations are also uh, in there. I can hear their voices, at least uh, one of them. So again, good morning and then welcome to Vasti 2.0, we call it Vasti 2.0, which is the Virtual Applied Data Science uh, Training Institute. It's 2.0 because last year we had the uh, Vasti uh, 1.0. Uh, My name is John Quajan. I'm a professor at Howard University and I'm also the director of uh, this program. So this is an NIH funded uh, program. So you are having it free because it's NIH funded and then also because your taxpayers or our taxpayers have paid for it. That is why you are having this uh, for free. I believe you are all aware of the tremendous amount of data that has is being generated and then the need for data scientists. So I will not go there, Professor Prem will maybe say more about uh, that. And I'm sure you will also find this program very useful over the next uh, eight weeks. This year, we call it the, the, uh, the spring training series, which means there will be a, a fall training series that will cover other aspects of uh, data uh, science. So if you don't get everything in this uh, spring series, there will be more in, in, in the fall. I mean, especially if you already have some of the concepts that will be covered uh, in this uh, uh, spring uh, uh, series. So again, welcome to this uh, program. And then before we start a few uh, housekeeping, uh, you have, or you probably all of you have seen it, you have access to Slack. That is where the recordings uh, of uh, this uh, series uh, will be placed. There will be a, a YouTube link, but you have to check that uh, from uh, uh, Slack. And then of course, Slack is where you can also have communications among yourself and then also uh, involving uh, the, the TA. Also, there will be TAs that will be available to help you or to answer questions, especially if you need uh, further clarification for uh, any of the uh, concepts uh, that will be uh, presented. So the course materials, and then also if there will be any data set and things will be put in Vasti, uh, GitHub. I'm sure you have that, or at least you can check uh, from Slack. Again, if you have any questions, if you are not seeing anything that you are looking for, you can also go to uh, Slack and then post uh, that question and then add a link or whatever will, you'll be directed uh, to those. Now, if you go to the Vasti uh, GitHub, there won't be only recordings for, for Vasti 2.0. Oh, you also find recordings for Vasti 1.0 if you want to review uh, those uh, uh, as well. Uh, there will be different uh, modules and then today's module that is the first one is Foundations of Data Science. And then we are fortunate to have Professor Prem Saga who is an expert with this to lead us with uh, the very first uh, uh, module.
Pram Saga is a professor at University of Maryland College Park and teaches data science and big data systems at the graduate school level. He has over 25 years of experience in the field of data science and has worked at distinguished institutions and organizations, including Microsoft, National, Uh, uh, Security Defense uh, Advanced Research uh, Project uh, agencies. He has developed several public data science module, including even COVID-19 model, and I'm sure he'll probably share uh, some of those uh, uh, to you. Now, if you are into crypto, he is also a, the chief data scientist at Crypto uh, uh, Corporation. Uh, Pram, is, is that the same at crypto.com or that's a different different term? Uh, it is a first uh, hi, nice to see everybody. It's entirely different. Uh, okay. oh, and first, if you can hear me, can you wave your right hand? Let me just make sure that okay, good. Yeah, hi everybody. So uh crypto is short for cryptology. So our our roots and the our backgrounds come from a, a mathematics background, um, supporting uh, some folks out in Maryland. Yeah. So we, we were crypto before crypto. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, Professor Prem. Okay, so without uh, any further ado, I will hand over to uh, Professor Prem to start uh, with this. So the foundations of data science. So Professor Prem, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. Um, I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, it seems that I was just telling John that every time we do the VATSDs, there's some type of incredible world event, right? So last time we met, we had, we were in the, the midst of COVID. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody is aware that there's turmoil in Europe this morning. So uh, hopefully we get past it quickly. Um, and it, what's more interesting about that is, is there are applications of um, how data science can um, perhaps mitigate some of these issues. Right, um, and we'll we'll touch on that. Uh, my goals for you today are to get to know everybody. Right, uh, we usually have a very uh, diversified audience, and I always find it interesting to figure out uh, who's here and what the expectations are. Um, I'll lay out a um, a background of what data science is. I'll give you guys some examples. I'll also open the floor up for those of you who, if you have questions about you know what we do, how how models are built. Uh, the day in the life of a data scientist. Uh, and then tomorrow we'll walk through a model. Now, I, I know some of you may not have um, built models before or you don't have a Python background, don't worry about it. Uh, my goal is to give you exposure um, to what these things are and what the inputs are, what the outputs are, so you have an understanding of um, you know, what it is we do. So, um, I'll give a little bit more uh, in-depth introduction, but uh, if it's possible, I think we have, let me see how many people we have. We have quite a, we have quite a few people. So um, I'll get started because I think, John, if we go through introductions through everybody, we may not have enough time or what do you think? Yeah. They can make the introduction as brief as possible, maybe yeah, just sure. one, one sentence introduction, not a paragraph, just a sentence yeah. introduction. Okay. Maybe two, uh, uh, <laughs> two sentences. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll call out your name. And then if you can tell us your name uh, and um, perhaps what you do and what your expectations for the program are. And that way I can tailor what we discuss today and tomorrow uh, to meet your expectations. So uh, let's get started with um, Dallas Ellis. You may be muted, let's see. Yes, you are muted, your hand is up, but you are muted. So you want to unmute yourself, Dallas, if you are still with us. Give it a second. Okay, Dallas, just enter your hand is up, but you're muted. So um, just interrupt me. So uh, Nana, I'll ask just because you're here. So uh, Nana, can you uh, introduce yourself? Yes, I'm, I'm Nana Osafu. I'm part of the RCMY team and I'm uh, glad to be here. Yeah, Nana is what makes everything go, right? So 
Um, he's put us together. He does all the tech work for us. He's a very, very brilliant engineer. Uh, Azad Buyan. Correct yes. Yes. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I'm from um, Jackson State University School of Public Health. I learning data science. I'm in. I'm in biostatistics. So uh, last two years, I'm. I I was in last year also. So trying to learn data science and apply Python R. So yeah, I, I feel enjoying it. So last two years, before That's I was great. not. I didn't know nothing, but now I know how to apply it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. The field is ever changing, right? And um, yes. we're constantly, mm -hmm. constantly learning. There's new uh, advancements. I'll talk about where things are with state of the art as well, but good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, is it, uh, and then orders are changed. So, um, Abiyadan Oter Lurin? Abiyadan? Hi, th thank you very much. Um, my name is Dr. Tulorin. I'm a family physician. I have a background in computer science and I actively write software and I've been uh, dabbling into R and I look forward to getting to Python and uh, doing some data analysis. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Akinyali Oni? Yes. Hi, um, nice to be here. Uh, I'm an environmental scientist and I've used R in the past. Uh, like you said, um, data science is continuously changing. I'd like to learn more. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Welcome. All right, let's see. Alejandro Velasquez? Um, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm from Puerto Rico, and I'm a biologist. I'm currently working in the University of Puerto Rico as a data science instructor. Um, I have some experience with uh, R, primarily um, Tidyverse, and now I just started working with Python. So, yeah, trying to <laughs> reinforce those uh, basic and probably... Um, advanced concepts of data science. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Alejandro. Yeah. Um, Alexander Rogers. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, Alexander, but I usually go by my middle name, Amon. I can't change my name here. But um, I'm assistant faculty over at uh, Charles Street University, uh, uh, family medicine doctor uh, who, during the pandemic, picked up Python because I wanted to make the next Dogecoin, but that didn't work out. And I realized I can use it for research now. So here I am. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. I think it's great that there's uh, so many folks in the medical field who are coming into data science, right? And I'll, I'll talk more about it and um, what, what can be done with it as well. It's fantastic. Uh, Arlesia Mathis. I'm an associate professor and I'm at the Institute of Public Health at Florida A&M University. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Austin Crutchfield. Hello, my name is Austin Crutchfield and I'm a recent graduate from Detroit, Mich from Detroit Michigan in biomedical physics. I'm looking here to learn more about data science and how it can be applied to medicine. What was the last thing you said? I'm sorry. I'm here to learn more about data science and the different ways it can be applied to medicine, health, things of that Great. nature. Thank you, yeah. Um, Karine Joan Franklin. Hi there, um, I, I'm Karine Joan Franklin. I'm faculty with the College of Pharmacy at Howard University, and I'm a clinical pharmacist. Good to be here. Thanks for being here, yeah. Um, Azad Bian. I'm from Jackson State University. Oh yeah, School yeah. Sorry, the order moved. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Azad. I thought we had called on you earlier. Uh, let's do. I have to make sure we're not calling. So Dallas Ellis. Dallas. 
Dallas, just interrupt us if you get your mic working. Uh, Daryl Joyner. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Daryl Joyner. I'm currently an uh, MBA student at the Howard University School of Business. I work for uh, Bloomberg. I work in data analytics, and I recently completed the uh, Google Data Analytics certificate, uh, where I got some exposure to our programming and um, uh, limited exposure to Python. We use Python at my job, so I'm looking to learn more about the Python programming language and how I can apply it uh, for data analysis and finance. That's great. Yeah. Um, Christian Dye. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Christian. I'm a postdoc at Columbia University, originally from Hawaii. Um, I really just want to get more experience with um, using high dimensional data to understand environmental health sciences, um, exposures and cardiometabolic health. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, is it uh, Daniel Thompson? Okay, just interrupt us. Uh, Dr. Chaimin Castor. Hi, good morning. I apologize for, I'm having a little oh. technical issues, but I'm Shimin Castor, Department of Nutritional Sciences. I'm looking forward to this class and I'm looking to uh, gain some additional understanding of learning R and Python so I could utilize that in my uh, courses. I teach um, techniques in community nutrition and research methods, so this will be good um, opportunity to introduce some of that technique in my, in my courses. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Rog Regress, Ellie. Good morning. Um, I work at Morgan State University, uh, where I manage their core facilities, and I'm actually very new to uh, data science, so I'm pretty excited. Well, that's great. Yeah. Uh, Ebel? Just interrupt us when your mic starts working. Um, Emory Sanders? Hi, it's Emira. Um, Hi, Emira. The, um, I'm Emira Sanders. I'm a grad student at Mahara Medical College. And I'm currently doing um, genomic uh, research for American Cancer Society. And I would like to further, you know, advance my skills. So in my professional, where I would like to go into, I would like to go into like data research. Great. Yeah. Um, Emmanuel? Hi, my name is Emmanuel from the Clinical Research Unit at Howard University Hospital, and I'm here to you know, get some more in-depth knowledge about data science. So let's go. That's great. Hi, Emmanuel. Sure. Um, Feng Xia? Feng Xia Yan. Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Feng Xia Yan. I'm the Associate Professor Statistician at Morehouse School of Medicine. So I'm using SAS and R uh, for the most. Uh, I, I'm here to learn um, using Python for the data science. Thank you. That's great. Hi, welcome. Uh, Francis Tulluri. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm Francis Tulluri from Jackson State University. I'm currently in my office uh, straight from my class. Um, I'm faculty and um, work in environmental science, uh, meteorological factors and health impacts. And also I work on edge computing. Um, my expectation is to make uh, this workshop or training to streamline uh, applications of uh, data science modeling or machine learning, machine learning modeling in my work. I did apply and I know a little bit, but I want to be more precise and organized. Fantastic. And so um, after you do this stuff enough, you find the patterns and sort of the cookbooks 
of how we put models together. And so we can definitely walk through some examples to give you um, a background and, and improve efficiency. Sure, thank you. Yeah, sure, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, Harris McFerrin. Okay, uh, Jacqueline Lechuga. Lechuga, yeah. As she noted that her camera and audio does not work, but she introduced herself in the chat. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Fifth year graduate, graduate student, psychology PhD program at Texas at UTEP. Uh, Tim Hardaway, are there any Tim Hardaway fans in the room? Yeah, great UTEP basketball player. Um, okay, welcome Jacqueline. Uh, Jane An Anui. Aloha, Jane Anoa from the University of Hawaii in the Department of Psychiatry and Research Division um, and just for general learning about data science. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. Uh, Jessica Bray. Hello, everyone. I'm a graduate student at the University of Texas at El Paso, and I study social psychology. I do a lot of programming for my experiments, and I'm uh, looking forward to learning some more about Python. Um, that's great. Do you program in R or Python now? Uh, I do a lot of my data analysis in R in terms of programming experiments. I've used like milliseconds inquisit or eCrime, that sort of thing. But I know Python is really big in, in our field, so I'm excited to learn it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll talk about why and what it is. And I have the deepest respect for R, but I'll um, talk about the differences and uh, what are the similarities as well. So. Yeah, it's a pretty easy jump, pretty easy jump. So, okay, um, we've already talked to John. Um, let's see, uh, Juan Carlos Rivera. Good morning. Um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Charles Drew University. Um, I would like to learn about big data. Um, I work in cell biology research related to endocrinology. That's it. Great, thank you. Um, is it Jyoti? Sim Hadri? Hi, I'm Jyoti Mai. Jyoti Hello. Mai. Hi. Nice to meet everyone here. Um, I'm a research associate uh, working in College of Medicine at Harvard University. And I'm interested in learning about this data science, for, especially for uh, applying to biomedical research. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, uh, Jyoti Mai. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, Kamala Jones. Just interrupt us if you, um, or post in the chat. Uh, Michael Payne. I see, okay. Currently working at the Department of Medical Professional Education. The audio and computer I'm using does not work well, so I'll have to type, no background data science, but I want to get exposed to it in an effort to learn something new. Fantastic, that will happen. Nice to meet you, Michael. Uh, Kimberly Prosper. Hi, everyone. My name is Kimberly Prosper. I am a I'm a graduate student in the public health program at Howard University, and I'm trying to get some more exposure to data science. Um, I'm new to the field and um, just getting as much information as I can. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, welcome. Um, um, mo mobology? Mobology? Yeah. Um, my name is Mobology Sandodi. I'm a physics student at the Morgan State University. And um, I just recently started using LaTeX and Python. And um, my professor actually advised that I take this class in order to broaden my uh, knowledge of Python and LaTeX. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, non who?
just interrupt us uh, when your mic comes on, Nanhu. Um, Napapan Salyusuta. Salyusuta. Hi, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, um, I am a physicist uh, for faculty at the University of Hawaii. I'm here to learn about data science and possibly Python. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, Noah Afbangjedi. Afbangbeji? Yeah. yeah, good morning. My name is Noah Afbangbeji. I'm a, a I'm a RA at Howard University and Center of Sickle Cell Disease, as well as a um, doctoral candidate uh, in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics. I've had a brief exposure to uh, Python in, at the University of Michigan summer statistic program and just want here to further this knowledge, primarily looking into multiple biomarker of chronic kidney disease in sickle cell patients. So anything biological and data analysis will be helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, is it Enzube? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, good morning. Um, my name is Enzube Oboluche. I'm a PhD candidate at, uh, in bioenvironmental science, Morgan State University. So um, I would say I don't really have any basic knowledge of data science, but I'm here to learn um to learn and adopt some skills in, in data science because i'm you know thinking about going into like a data career path so um yeah that's mine and i hope to learn new things and develop my skills fantastic you. hey, you're welcome um is it's o carrasco hi good morning my name is former carrasco I'm a cognitive psychology student at UTEP, and I, I am looking forward to learning more about data science. A lot of UTEP, that's great, yeah. A lot of UTEP and a lot of Hawaii, yeah. Um, Regina Ofado? Uh, my name is Regina Ofado. I am interim chair of the Department of Medical Education uh, Director of the Simulation Center, Chief of Clinical Skills at Meharry Medical College. I am interested in data science uh, because we have a new school of data science and also trying to keep up with my students um, with their knowledge of all this data. And also so I can have conversations with my 19 and 20 year old sons who are all into computers. So it would be helpful yeah. in a lot of ways. So thank you. So excellent, yeah. excellent point, Regina. And every term they get stronger. It's really interesting. You know, I'm just like, what? I, they come in knowing these things, right? So, uh, um, okay, great. Thomas Feng Wei. Uh, did you call me Thomas Sandbuchel? Uh, it's just Thomas F U N G W E. I guess it's truncated. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. okay. Thomas. Yes, I'm Thomas Von Goy. Hello. Hi, Thomas. Can yeah. You hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm Thomas Von Goy. I'm a faculty in nursing and allied health sciences at Howard University. Um, I'm into data sciences, but my main interest is in the big data and its application to precision health. Precision health? Like we have precision medicine, precision nutrition, precision. That's where genes interact with medicine. Now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. 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 Um, we'll, we'll talk uh, about big data as well today, and I'll cite some examples as well as to how this stuff works. Um, and it turns out that that is maybe, maybe at least half the problem. These two things are related, right? Data science, AI, and big data. And I'll, uh, very, very uh, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Tom Melman. Hi, I'm a professor of psychiatry at Howard University and director of the uh, clinical translational uh, research program supported by a CTSA grant as well as the sleep stress 
uh, research program, and I want to be able to uh, better collaborate with data scientists moving forward and to advocate for data science uh, infrastructure in our clinical translational uh, programs. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Torben. Hi, actually, uh, that's my son's name. I'm Thomas Heinvoker. I'm a professor of anatomy at Howard University, and I'm also running the anatomy department. And uh, uh, since the pandemic started, I've been part of some global uh, consortium to analyze data on uh, COVID cases, and we use a lot of Python and other uh, tools that I'm not really familiar with. So I hope I get a little bit of an introduction into those tools and uh, be able to possibly apply those in the future. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Inugbe Chika. We're in pretty good progress here. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, I am Chika Onevo, just a, a postdoctoral fellow in uh, Morgan State University. I am really keen being here because uh, I, I've been longing to know more about uh, our data sciences. I'm just a foreigner there. So I'm really looking forward to learning much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, William Sutherland. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Sutherland, and I work with uh, uh, um, John Clayton. Uh, uh, in bringing this, this uh, workshop to you. And uh, I'm the PI of the Howard University's Research Centers and Minority Institutions Program. I also hope to learn a lot this time around, hopefully, as well. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, Yikuang Zhang. My name is Yi Chiang Zhang. I'm an assistant professor in Jepson School of Medicine, University of Hawaii. And good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaga, for uh, holding the class. My study is about genomic, uh, genomic functional genomics of heart failure and would like to learn more with a better uh, system in data science. I have background in R, but I think uh, to learn more. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so William VA, did we already call you? If you did, I'm sorry, yeah. No, there's two Williams, so I think this is um, a different one. Yeah, Prem, yeah, this is William Ampe. So oh, hi, William. Uh, yeah. I'm part of the TA core for this, uh, for this uh, effort. Uh, I have a, a background in computer science and so very familiar with R and, and Python, but you always learn new. I mean, uh, you you meet you meet uh, instructors like Prem, and you see that you, are, <laughs> you 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 have a lot to learn. So so I think this is an ex is experience for me, and I'm very sure it's going to be a great experience for 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 you all. So thank you, and I see. You. Thanks, William. Yeah. Uh, Yuan Yuan Fu. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm from University of Hawaii, John A. Brown School of Medicine. So I have doing some biomedics work before, but I want to learn more Python language from this workshop. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, welcome. And Zen Wei Wang. Hello, everybody. Yes, I'm from University of Hawaii Tour Center. Yes, and now I'm learning uh, Python by myself. So I want to learn more here, the data analysis using Python. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, I think we've gotten through uh, just about everybody. If you, I'll open the floor if you want to interrupt me if we did uh, get to you. If not, just interrupt me as we go. I'm going to load up some slides um, and take us through the course now. Nice to see so many people from so many different backgrounds. Okay. And Prem, just a minute. Of, uh, there is a sign-in link in the chat area, especially for those who need a certificate for participation. You want to sign in uh, in there. So check the chat area for the link to that. Fantastic, thanks. All right, so let me share my screen. 
Um, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Great. So let me see. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Presentation mode. It. Uh, all right. So let me share a different screen because it always puts it on with a different one. Okay. So now you should see the slides moving. Hopefully, let me see if I can pan forward. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay, so uh, a bit about me. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Maryland, uh, where I teach uh, big data systems and uh, data science and AI at the grad level. Uh, I'm at College Park, and I'm also the chief data scientist at Crypto. Uh, Crypto is a federal contractor um, that specializes in AI and supports the Department of Defense, as well as the Department of Justice. Um, most recently, we are um, um, working on modernizing and improving um, Arcos. Does anybody know what Arcos is? So um, Arcos is the uh, database that the Department of Justice maintains to track uh, all prescription um, drugs. Uh, that are sent to pharmacies, research institutions, universities. Uh, and so we can't see um, that someone, for example, got a particular prescription, but we can see from uh, the moment a drug is created to um, it then going to distributors and it then going down to pharmacies, uh, the life uh, time of that drug, as well as how the drug is um, uh, discarded, right? So the, the maintenance of this. And the idea behind this is there was a, a Washington Post article a couple of years ago. Did anybody read this? Anybody seen this? Yeah, they did a, they did a fantastic, I'll, I'll post links to it in the, description, in the chats, but the, the Post did, uh, and the, the West Virginia Gazette did a fabulous piece on uh, how disproportionately uh, certain areas were being impacted by opium, opioids. And uh, what they found is that the amount of pills uh, per capita, right, um, that were going to West Virginia uh, and Florida were much higher than any other places in the, in the country. And that had um, DEA, uh, who's charged with monitoring these things, enforcing these things, uh, had better analysis and was more proactive, um, the opioid epidemic could have been considerably uh, less lethal. And uh, the Government Accountability Office uh, got wind of the report. Uh, Congress got wind of the report. There were several investigations uh, looking into uh, the practices behind what happens in Arcos, uh, which is again, that database that tracks all of this. And they said, uh, there's huge inefficiencies, there's gotta be better ways to manage this, to find violations, to spot these per capita blips, uh, and then report and um, uh, enforce and mitigate these issues. So um, we were brought in to do that. We've um, fielded a prototype, the GAO has come and looked at it. And so it's, it's interesting. And um, so that's what we've most recently been working on. And I, I find it, um, it's very, very interesting. And, and as alluded to earlier, a, a large part of the problem is um, how we build these models. But a more practical concern is how do we deal with all the data? Uh, and uh, another part of that is how do we understand, like one thing is the mechanics of it, right? Like how do we ingest this? How do we process this amount? How do we do it in a timely manner? How do we make sure that uh, the veracity is taken care of and we have good checks? But a second factor and, and what we found most challenging, uh, there's, and let me be clear, there's, there's definitely challenges in the federal government, okay? But uh, from a modeling perspective, there's a huge learning curve to the domain. And so we all had to become 
basically, you know, uh, uh, drug aficionados. We had to figure out, you know, we had to think like pharmacists and we had to think like analysts. And so, so much time um, for the data scientists was just understanding that. And so while many people are trying to understand Python and data science, and that is, I think, becoming more and more well-defined, uh, it's, it's also very tricky for the data scientists to figure out the domain space. Uh, and so that was a major, major challenge, but very interesting, right? We learned a lot about how uh, drugs move back and forth. So good to see that there's a large um, uh, public health uh, audience with us today. Okay, so that's largely what's been happening at crypto. Uh, I spent several years at the National Security Agency. I can only talk to you briefly about what happened there. I was the data scientist for many years. Um, I was at FINRA. Uh, FINRA is the Financial Regulatory Authority. They are um, charged with monitoring like 98% of all financial transactions, looking for fraud, supporting the SEC. Um, another gigantic uh, application of big data. I'm just looking at the chat to make sure I didn't miss anything here, sorry. Um, thanks, Melissa, yeah. And um, before that, I was at DARPA. Has, and out of curiosity, has anybody seen the movie Wanted? Right, you've seen that movie, you know, with the, the curved bullets? Anybody seen that where they snap their wrist? Apparently, if you fire a gun and you snap your wrist fast enough, the, the bullet will curve. That's one of the premises behind this movie. So um, DARPA is an interesting place. Uh, they take on projects that are too high risk for the private sector and, and, and even, uh, you know, university researchers, because there's so much funding involved. And I mentioned Wanted because the Curve Bullet project, or this idea of Curve Bullets, is a real project. It's a real DARPA project. Uh, and, and they actually have a bullet that can curve, right? You don't, it doesn't require that wrist snap either. So... Um, several years at DARPA working on um, uh, effectively cyber attack simulations. Uh, and, and then I spent several years at Microsoft as a data scientist um, servicing both uh, operations out in Seattle and then in the public sector out here. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, let's see. Uh, another thing uh, about me is um, I am the uh, proud father of twins triplets and a border collie. I don't know if any of you are familiar with border collies. Uh, they are their own sort of family enigma, right? Uh, and so um, he's extraordinarily high energy. Uh, yeah. Um, and so what's interesting is uh, they all have the same birthday four years apart, not including our dog. So the twins, and let me see, can you, you see this? So, um, uh, this is love, this is Veer, uh, this is Cal, this is Thor, and this is Q, uh, and this is crypto down here. And um, so the twins are nine, the triplets are identical and are five, and everybody's birthday is on May 27th. Um, so I've worked out the math for those of you who are inclined. I'm sure you're wondering like, what are the chances? Uh, and all five are boys, the missus wanted one girl, this is what happens. And so um, what are the chances, right? So globally, um, about 3% of um, uh, pregnancies result in twins. And um, there's, uh, so yeah, so you have that and then you have it over um, 365 days to get the same. Oh yeah, yeah, so, so the twins are 30, uh, one out of 33. The low end for identical triplets, the problem is the sample size is small. We'll talk about this as we go forward. Um, but the sample size for identical triplets is so small that we have these wide confidence intervals. And so at the low end, you have one out of 60,000 are identical triplets. Uh, and then since to have the same birthday, you get one out of 365. So putting that together, you get one out of 722 million. Sorry, yeah. So one out of 722 million. And on the High end, it's estimated as high as one out of 200 million. So putting that together, you get one out of 2.4 trillion. So the numbers are low. Uh, but what does that mean? What does that mean practically, right? So if you were to look at, uh, let's say half the world's population, 
uh, which equals, let's say, you know, the family. So you get 3.8 billion people uh, and you divide uh, that by the lower occurrence, right? The one out of 722 million, that means that there could be five other couples like this in the world, right? I happen to know one other. Um, uh, so does anybody know anybody else with twins and triplets? There's someone quite famous. I'll wait. Someone can chime out if they know. I'll give it, let's say 10, 15 seconds on this one. Anybody know? Uh, is it, and I'll, let me look in the chat as well. Uh, does Mariah have twins and triplets? I know she has two sets. I thought she had two sets of twins. Yes, and J John is right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Elon also has twins and triplets. And he has, they're also all boys. Uh, his triplets are not identical. Um, but yeah, he's also very, very busy, right? So. Uh, and every day is like a sleepover at our house. And that's how I tell it. It's just crazy you know, all the time. Um, and if you take the higher bound of this, so uh, there's so there's five other couples. So that you know two of them now, right? Uh, there's, uh, if you take this um, uh, one out of 2.4 trillion, then, you know, maybe there's some others in the universe, but it, it's at least Elon and, and us for now. So, okay. Um, all right. So I'll start with what is data science? And uh, at its, I mean, I'll give you some formal definitions as well, but I always like to try to be visual about um, what's being discussed. And um, really it is taking unorganized phenomena and organizing it so that we can figure out either what's happening, or why something happened, or where things are going, right? And um, I like to, you know, use this this graphic because at first, you know, when I look at this, I see just you know chaos. But if you stare a little longer at it, you know, you start to notice things, right? And um, you know, first I see like, you know, little, I always think of periodical things, right? So you see like a little sine wave emerging a little bit and um, there's, there's several light bulbs and there's, you know, charts and graphs. And so the question is, you know, how do we make sense of this, right? Uh, for those uh, physicists in the audience, um, it's, it's really taking the energy of the phenomena and trying to make it more organized, right? Like energy changes forms and it goes from, you know, organized to disorganized, but it's still the same. So really what we do, a lot of what we do is organization, right? You'll find that, like, how do we get more structure of the situation um, so that we can figure out uh, what, why, and where, where is it going? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so a little bit more formal. Um, it's a multidisciplinary field that uses scientific methods, processes, algorithms, and systems to extract knowledge and insights from structured and unstructured data. This is the big part, right? The multiple disciplines are mathematics. So I find myself using calculus all the time, right? Partial differential equations all the time. So for those of you who took PDE and were like, what's the point? We use it all the time. Um, statistics, this is probably the most um, readily identifiable part of data science. Uh, and and if, you were talk, if you were to talk to a data scientist, you, know, you would hear things like, I code in Python a lot, I'm in Jupyter a lot, I'm building these models, and I'm having to explain and develop these models using uh, best practices from statistics, right? And uh, this whole idea of having to build models uh, and, and you know, for projections for what, what it is right now and why things happened is, is based on sampling. And there's no way to sample without having uh, an excellent understanding of statistics. 
and making sure that your sampling methods are sound, right? So uh, straight away, that is usually the divider between someone who is programming or who's a developer and someone who's a data scientist. The data scientist must have a sound understanding of statistics. Um, and that's why it's hard to get, right? It's, it's hard to get statisticians, it's hard to get programmers, it's even harder to get statisticians who want to program, right? Um, computer scientists, so um, we do a lot of programming and I think what's happened, and it, and it makes sense that it's happened this way, is big data has changed it so that you have to have a, a pretty strong computer science background. And what I mean by that is we spend a lot of time using tools like Spark, we use a lot of tools like Dask, we're constantly thinking about um, uh, horizontal scaling, we use cloud computing, um, there are experiments in quantum computing. So um, that, it, that leads to having a background in computer science and you have to be able to specialize in these fields as well. So again, more complexity to the area, right? So start with just a programmer, that's one thing. You have to understand statistics now, okay, fine. And now you also have to understand how to deal with these big data technologies, which are challenging. Has anybody set up Spark? Is anybody using Spark in the audience? Yeah? And uh, William, did, did, you, did you enjoy setting up Spark? I think you're muted. It take, yeah. It takes, yeah, it takes some effort, uh, but uh, I have users that I have to uh, support. So you don't want to say, I don't know. So yeah, it takes, it takes, an, it takes an effort, but everything is online. Uh, the first time was difficult, but once you've done it once, then it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and it is it's particularly challenging, you know, so you have to, the idea is we can't solve these problems with our laptops. The data is too big, or even if, even if you can get it on your laptop, the algorithm is too time consuming for the resources you have. So you have to find a way to farm out the processing and or the memory required to deal with it. Uh, and that by itself can be challenging, right? Yeah, and, and, Straight away, you have to have the resources, right? So costs come into play. Um, it's very interesting. A, 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 a brilliant peer of mine uh, out at uh, University of California recently published a paper, uh, and he could not could not compute uh, the results of the paper on his uh, laptop, and certainly not even on University of California's. Um, uh, he's in Santa Clara, so he could not even um, process it all uh, on in their labs. So he had to go to the cloud. And what's fascinating is, is the papers computate, this is just a research paper, right? The research papers computational costs were $30,000, right? So this is like where the field is going. It's the amount of processing power that is needed to pull off these results are expensive. So expensive that you can't really do it locally. Like, are you going to set up a computing cluster in, in your office? Do you wanna build a lab on campus? Is your lab strong enough to even handle these things? We'll talk about some of the advances in deep learning which require you know, thousands of GPUs. So um, an understanding of how to tackle uh, big data is also, very important. And then uh, the information science, right? So, you know, how do, we, how do we curate this data? How do we understand this data? And uh, are there any librarians in the audience, by the way? The deepest, deepest respect for librarians. So I, I think librarians are making a comeback, making a comeback. And I say that because you have to, manage all this data, right? Like we, and and I th you see this in, in institutions that are very mature and have models. So for example, Tesla. Tesla's largest endeavor in AI is full self-driving. And uh, they've made advances. Uh, and the way they do it is using a technology called supervised learning and uh, via a deep learning model. And we'll talk more about what that is. But the short of it is they use 
um, humans to label video clips of good driving and to label video clips of bad driving. And then the machine learns what's good and what's bad, very much like how we teach our kids. You know, they'll do something and we'll say, okay, that's good. And they register that, we'll do, we'll, they'll do something, we'll say that's bad, they register that and they learn incrementally through trial and error over and over and over again. And so these data labelers or you know, uh, librarians of the data, the keepers of this data uh, are really what makes Tesla go in this situation. I mean, they have data that's being generated from the drivers, but someone's got to sit there and label it. Now they're talking about automatic labeling um, and at some point when the machines get context, that may happen. Um, but right now you can get a job as a, a data labeler. Uh, even to this day, Google uh, has people monitoring their index saying that this is appropriate, this is inappropriate. This is linked to this topic, this is not linked to this topic. And that is because for all, for all of humanity's shortcomings, we're still state of the art, right? And uh, what we understand, the machines don't yet. And so if we can harness that collective understanding from you know, data labelers and people who are well-versed in the phenomena we're trying to model, um, that makes the machines learn and understand from our context. So very, very important, right? You have to, you, have, you build these models, but then you have to have someone or teams to curate and keep them from straying, lying off. Okay. Um, so we'll go through each of these. So the basics of statistics. So the science of making a prediction about an entire population based on a sample, right? And so, you know, when the next attack will occur, uh, we, the, the US government said the attack was gonna occur last Wednesday, right? Uh, I think that was early, but we did have cyber attacks. Uh, and so I guess the Putin decided to wait a week for the full-blown attack. Um, you know, who will win the next presidential election? Uh, you know, how is it done, right? We do it through sampling probabilities, hypothesis testing, even now, right? So a lot of the manual processes that are used in statistical modeling um, have been automated uh, through these data science pipelines and models, but still you have to have very good practices on how you sample, right? Are you gonna sample randomly? Are you looking at a target group? Um, you know, what do you expect your confidence intervals to be, right? So um, all of these things have to be factored in and um, you'll see some examples of that as well. Uh, on, on, a, on a point of this, this is a, key, a key part of this is that we take, we take samples to try to predict what's gonna happen with the population. We run a trial. We run a trial, let's say, on uh, a COVID drug. And we say, okay, the trial did very well, say vaccine, right? We run a trial and we, we, we have the vaccine and the vaccine does very well on the sample population. And then we say, you know, we sampled randomly and we sampled across different age groups and the vaccine worked well. So we believe that it is going to do well for the general population, okay? So it's a model, it may not have AI in it, but certainly it has statistics in it. The other side of this is what happens if you try to get access to the entire population, right? So one thing is, we, you know, we don't have everybody's health data. We don't, you know, if we did, then that would be different. But like, if we don't have it, so we have to, and we don't have access to everybody. So we have to take a sample and try to run these trials and then extrapolate out. But what if you could get access to the population? At that point, you, you minimize or get close to asymptotically approach the population. At that point, you minimize the sampling uh, effects and you're able to make uh, a better prediction because you've gotten so much more data. And that is the idea behind big data attacks, 
So one once, and we use these in combination, but one side is, hey, we don't have all the data. Let's let's sample appropriately, build a model and, and project. The other side is let's just go get all the data and let's try to store it. And then we will, you know, maybe not even have to build a model. If we have everything we need, it can be that we solve this problem by just sorting. Right? So for example, you're in, in the Arcos case, we're trying to find where uh, anomalies are occurring across the country for uh, um, opioid dispensing, right? So is that an AI problem? Maybe. We can build a model to say, all right, you know, we've sampled across uh, various places with, very, with char certain characteristics. And we found that when uh, these characteristics are met, we believe that there is a higher incidence of opioid abuse, okay? Okay, fine. But what if you just got everybody's demographics and you got it down to, let's say, the zip code? Okay. And then you just sort by those, those factors and look for where the um, amount of opioids per capita down to the zip code, or maybe zip code combined with, say, the pharmacy are most egregious. Right. Now, now the problem is, is there's so much data. Right, it comes in daily, and you're talking about billions of records. But what if you have the ability to get at that? Right. So then you don't really need this model. It turns into a sort or or a, a grouping problem. So something to look for. And ultimately, we're going to talk more about big data. But in time, big data is not going to be a problem. Any ideas why? computing power and uh, and resources are going to be available because uh, if you're able to load the data and you, you have the data and you have the resources then go back to where we are now right yeah and i think you know the other thing is quantum computing uh, is real is coming there are already quantum computers that we have access to right google declared quantum supremacy saying that they could basically compute uh, arbitrary statistics uh, and operations on uh, data using quantum computers about a year ago. And uh, there's a company in College Park called D-Wave, uh, which has a quantum computer that AWS uh, uses internally. And so the idea is because, again, for the physics kids, uh, for the, given the amount of data that can be stored at the quantum level, the entire world's data, every piece of data that is stored right now in the world can be stored on a single quantum computer, right? Single quantum computer. And so this concept of having to work in parallel and, and you know, buy up all, this, all these resources is going to go out the window once quantum hits and becomes readily available. And I'm just looking at the chat as, as we go, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, okay, so yes, quantum computing. Very good, Alexander. So, and I would say, I mean, the prototypes are here. It's just, these things are not impossible. They're just very expensive. So let's say five years, maximum 10 years, right? We'll have access to these machines that can process data at any scale. And the, the, the and I'll, I'll draw this out for you, but the big, the big breakthrough in, in quantum, uh, one is yes, we're able to store all this data. Fantastic, we can put the whole world's data on a circuit board, okay? And I don't have to go into different places, no problem. But the, the big thing is its ability to work in parallel. Have any of you worked on like parallel algorithms? Yeah, so this is a very important, right? Because right now, if you're working on any kind of you know, remotely large data set, uh, sometimes you run everything at once, but it turns out that things can be done in parallel most of the time. And so to, to get things done in a timely manner, we split out tasks and we work in parallel. The work we did for DEA to get Arcos off the ground is largely parallel algorithms. algorithms. So what quantum buys you is effectively infinite memory. And why is that important? Every time you fork 
right? Uh, let me see if I can actually let me see if I can draw on this. Hold on a second, yeah. We'll, we'll zoom will let it come through or the uh, let's see if I can draw here. It may not uh, let me do it from there. Oh yeah, it's on the main screen. Okay. So if and I'll I'll sketch it out later if I can't do it here, but by having the ability to ha have so much memory, every time you fork and create a new process, they require memory to bookkeep. So, you, you know, you have four processes that you spin out, right? Or five processes that we spin out. Each one of these processes has to have a memory of where it was spawned. And uh, so there's like locks and uh, bookkeeping that go on for these processes that are running and they need to know when to come back. So five manageable. Now make these five 50 million processes. Okay. How are we going to manage all those processes? Well, it turns out that cr critical to managing those processes means we have to be able to store data and track data on those processes. And that is made possible via quantum. Right? We can do it you know, at thousands, millions now. But when you get to a point where you can do it effectively indefinitely, and you're, you have all this data in front of you, we'll be able to rip through these problems that are very, very difficult now. Quantum computing will change everything, everything. Uh, and hopefully for the better, hopefully for the better. Okay. Uh, so again, using random samples to make confident statements about an entire population. We're making intelligent guesses, speculation. Uh, you'll see we use several algorithms to, to do these things, depending on whether if it's a classification problem or regression problem. Um, but that's the idea behind statistics uh, in modeling. Um, so we look at um, the sample and um, you know, depending on what we're trying to do, we make sure that we've sampled randomly without bias. Uh, and then where are, are, are any people deal with missing data a lot? Yeah, um, missing data comes up all the time. I don't know if it's a phenomenon that's more common in the federal government because every federal project we worked on seems to have enormous amounts of missing data, but we see it in the private sector as well. And so, um, and it's important, right? This is another reason why you have to have a strong statistical background because if you sample on data that is say not missing at random, then you know that there's been um, mischief or that the, the question was stated unfairly. You know, if I ask everybody, what is your salary? Okay, some of you may answer, some of you may not, and some of you may answer, but tell me, you know, the, uh, a lie about your salary. Don't answer, okay, by the way. So uh, that doesn't mean the answer doesn't exist. It just means I've asked the question inappropriately. So we have missing data and it's missing and it's not missing at random. It's missing because I asked inappropriately. Or maybe you didn't want to tell me and you're supposed to, right? So you have to have uh, a good understanding of uh, why data is not where it needs to be. And um, there are several kinds, right? So missing completely at random, missing at random, and not missing at random. And we'll talk about those uh, as well. So again, you know, when we build these models, we have to sample. So we have to understand, you know, what is it? Uh, what, how are we sampling? What are the, the factors and how do we do it with um, best practice appropriately, appropriately? So then we look at, you know, another thing we do is we look at the shapes of these, uh, of the data. Um, so sometimes things are normally distributed. The hope is that most things are, but it turns out a lot of things aren't normally distributed. Wealth is not normally distributed. Um, how uh, COVID impacts certain populations is not normally distributed, right? So turn, there's actually quite a few things that are skewed. Um, and when that happens, we look to see where does it accumulate? So a lot of statistics is going on. And uh, again, we look at spreads, right? Standard deviations all the time, all the time. Okay. So again, samples give statistics, and populations, which we may never know, give parameters, right? The true mean. So, you know, let's say you're trying to predict um, what the actual height is. What's the average height for um, everybody in the United States, okay? So there is 
an average height, right? That parameter exists. We don't know what it is, but we're going to try to, let's say, sample some group randomly, uh, or, or that is also representative of what the popu US population is. And then we'll take their heights and hopefully be able to extrapolate that forward to say what the true parameter is of the height for all uh, people in the United States. I'm just looking at the chat. Uh, um, so Lane says, because we don't charge for data, it also has to be posted on time. Oh, okay, sorry, yes, yeah. All right, um, let me move this chat to a different window so I can see what's happening as we go. All right. <clears throat> yeah, some of are subsets of the population we study. Okay, so, All right, so the central, um, the central limit theorem, and this is uh, important and it's used as we sample even within the models we create, right? So the idea here is as the amount of trials go up, um, the true parameter will be approximated closer and closer. Um, so, you know, the message is that the more data you can get, uh, more quality data you can get, uh, the closer you're going to be in your uh, approximations. And even if the phenomena, and this is important, and you, you'll see it as you start building models, even if the phenomena you're looking at is not normally distributed, the way you build your model and go through selections um, should be normally distributed. And what do, what do I mean by that? You'll see it when we go through an example, but the, the idea is uh, when you start to approximate some, some phenomena, you will make decisions in your models on, uh, okay, how many, let, let's say, what level of sensitivity do I want to apply using this algorithm? Or what level of precision do I want to apply using this algorithm? And um, what happens when we um, learn uh, the phenomena and then we say, try to apply that to a test set to see if we're generalizing correctly. And, and what happens when we change the distribution of uh, training and test and how does that change the model's accuracies, right? And in, indeed, a central question in data science uh, and, and really math, physical phenomena overall is uh, where do you draw the line? You know, is it, is it uh, we split 50-50 on training and test sets? Is it, uh, um, is it the Donbass area in Ukraine? Like where, where do you draw the line? And so this, this problem of uh, is 8020 is a good one. So um, you have to figure out what happens when there's different um, scenarios. And so what we do, it's something called cross-validation. Uh, and those of you in, in um, who have statistics backgrounds have seen this, we apply the same things internally, right? So what will happen is, is we'll, we'll build some model and uh, we'll, we'll say, hey, we're gonna use this set of data uh, and we'll, we'll use this as training. And then we'll use, we'll set up part of that data to be test so that we can say, all right, well, we've learned this and now we wanna project to see if we got it right. And we'll check our results with the test set. You'll see an example of this as we go forward. And the question is, well, what did you choose as training and test? Because just the order of things can change things around. Right, it's and it, it can be quite telling if you chose to use maybe the best samples in your training data to get you know accuracy on the test data. So and that makes the model look artificially good as you build it. But when you go out into the real world, it won't be uh, as accurate. Right. So so what do we do? Well, uh, in in terms of when you have this uncertainty. One way to deal with it is we say, well, let's just try different combinations of the train test splits. Okay. And when you run those train test splits, the more you do and the more combinations you run, you should start to approach what the 
actual accuracy is of the data set on most importantly, unseen data, right? So the same, and, and how do we do that? We use statistics uh, and the more trials we do and the more sampling we do, uh, and, the, and effectively the more models we create with different trained test splits gives us a more realistic idea of what the accuracy will be when it goes out to data we've never seen. Yes, exactly, right? So stratified sampling or, or cross-validation. So again, another, another um, uh, point where you have to be well-versed in statistics and best practices in order to field these models. If you field a model without cross-validation, the, the, the comment is, the question is going to come up, how did you decide where to split? How did you decide what was training, what was test? How do you know, right? And um, I mean, and th this is a, a, a very, very big question because what happens is if you just build a model on what you, on, on all the data, like for example, uh, I have a peer, a friend of mine who is, um, 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 political science, right? Political science major. And um, he says, you know, we, ne we never do train test splits. We look at all the data and we fit a curve to it. You know, we use ARIMA and uh, we fit a curve to it and we forecast going forward. I said, okay, that's great. But how do you know that it's going to work on data that you've not seen before? He says, well, you know, we, we look at it and if it's out of shape, then we just run another model. And I said, okay, well, why don't you try train, train test splits? Why don't you train on maybe the first 50% and see if it extrapolates well to the last 50%, the latest data, right? And he says, okay, we could do that. But the problem is, is we would lose um, predictive power, right? And that's true. But you also run the risk of uh, one of the biggest problems in data science, overfitting, right? It looks great in the lab, but it dies as soon as you let it out, right? So what we do is, you know, how do we figure out if we can build something that does not die when it goes out in production? And the way you do that is, is you simulate it, right? So what we're gonna say is we're gonna say, look, we have this data set, let's cut it so that we have no idea what 50% of it looks like or 80 or 20% of it looks like. And we'll try different cuts, okay? And when we do that, and we run the models and train on this section, and then predict on this section, you get to see if your model actually generalizes well on data that it's not seen before, before having to go out publicly and then you know, pull back your predictions and, and reassess, right? So, and again, how do we do that? We do that through statistical sampling. So two different thoughts. One gives you better predictive power, but can overfit and needs to be redone as you, as you drift away from the actual phenomena. Um, and the other one simulates what it's like to not have data. That is the standard when we build models now using data science and AI, right? You'll see um, accuracies for uh, training and you'll see accuracies for what we call either validation or test. And the reality is, is your training accuracy could be 100%, nobody cares. What matters is how accurate you were on unseen data, right? You could have accuracy of 60% in training, but if your accuracy was say 95% on data that you've not seen before, that's what counts, right? So you have to be able to do, to show that. And we use statistics in order to do that, largely based on cross-validation, simulating the process of not having the data so that when we do go out in the field where we don't have the data, we have an expectation of what will happen. Yeah. So again, a, a big, big part of this, right? Statistical sampling. And the more trials, the better. Okay. Another example of this, uh, as trials go up, we approach the true parameters. Uh, the second most important chart probably in data science, right? Um, so the normal distribution, and what this is saying is that uh, one gene, one deviation to the left and right, 68.2, uh, seven percent of observations will fall. Two deviations out is ninety-five point four five percent, and three deviations out is ninety-nine point seven three percent. Right now, what's important about this is is we could have chose um, any of these 
probabilities. Okay, we could have chose 65%. We could have chose 98%, right? Uh, and we could have chose 99.85%, right? Anybody have an idea why we, why we took these probabilities? I mean, they, they, they do model out on the curve well, but the biggest factor is that they map to integers, right? One, two, and three standard deviations on the normal distribution give you these parameters. But it's not like that's gospel, right? So it's just easy. The machines could care less about one, two, or three. We like it, okay? So, but it isn't important to know that in a normal distribution, things taper off in this geometric form. That's a big, big finding in statistics that helps us uh, address the probability of something happening um, and, and how to um, either change because it's very, very different than what we expect or say that something is within uh, range. Okay. Uh, I'll leave you all to complete this, okay? So, uh, and the, the idea here is it depends on where you are, right? In the, in the court systems, you could argue either way, but let's say uh, you're all innocent until proven guilty, right? We don't wanna put someone away who is in fact innocent. So uh, we, we err this way. And uh, the same thing applies with hypothesis testing, right? Before we toss, uh, the existing hypothesis and idea, um, we give it the benefit of the doubt. It's up to us to disprove it. Why is that important? So you're, you're a data scientist or you're, you're working on some, some phenomena and you're trying to model it and you're trying to build a prediction. And um, there may already be predictions about this phenomena. So it is now up to you to say that, hey, we have the same prediction, I agree or I have something entirely different. But what is different? How do you prove different, right? Is 96 versus 95 different? Maybe, it depends on the confidence intervals, it depends on how you sample, how many trials are there, right? So what we do as convention is we say that the existing hypothesis holds until you disprove it. And how do you disprove it? Depends on the factors in play. Most of the time we say 95% uh, confidence interval, and then we say plus or minus some thresholds, right? All of those are gonna be functions of how you sample um, and the um, uh, statistical properties of the distribution of your sample, right? So uh, it is, even though the models do a lot of work for us, it is still up to you to be able to prove that your model's hypothesis is either in line with the current hypothesis is, or is completely new or is completely different from the existing hypothesis. And all of that is done still through hypothesis testing. We spend um, you know, two, solid courses, two solid classes on just hypothesis testing, right? So all the Z scores and the P values, all of that comes back into play. When you talk to a fellow data scientist, we'll sit there and say, what were the P values? At what confidence interval do you, did you put this out, right? What are the, you know, what are the plus minus? What is the margin of error? All of this is the lingo that is used because, you know, how does the decision maker know otherwise? I feel the model, let's say the existing model is at 90% accuracy. Uh, and it has 90% uh, um, confidence interval and it's plus or minus, let's say three. So it could be 87 to 93, right? And I walk in there and say, okay, my accuracy is 92%, right? And, and, and I say, my model is better. You need to feel my model. So now we get into, well, who's right, right? And the way we say who's right is, well, there's, no, there's never a number in statistics in isolation. There's got to be a confidence interval with the margin of error, right? So at what confidence is your data and what is the margin of error? And, and, and then we can get into, is your model in fact better than what is existing? So again, even though a lot of the statistical uh, 
uh, uh, modeling and mathematical modeling has been automated. The way that we adjudicate and say that one model is better than the other or internally figure out which models, what is the, the likelihood of the model's real parameter accuracy is all managed through statistics, right? Okay. <clears throat> well, and you'll see examples of this. I'm starting at 20,000 feet so that you get an overview of what it is we do. Uh, and then we'll step into some examples. So uh, how do we prove it? Through hypothesis testing, right? Uh, the point of hypothesis testing is to make sure we don't jump to bad conclusions. Um, they can be confusing. Xylitol versus Florida, I'll, I'll talk about this. Uh, and we're inherently speculating, albeit rigor rigorously. So we try to control the guessing by being conservative and use innocent until proven guilty, right? How many of you have done a hypothesis test? Lots of you, some of you, yeah. So we do them all the time. And in papers that you publish, you'll have to specify whether or not, you know, what your parameters were and why you believe that this is either uh, in line with the current hypothesis that supports it, or that um, you believe that there is a new phenomena that's been uncovered here and that your hypothesis disproves uh, the existing hypothesis. Okay. Um, I don't know, this is the null hypothesis. And you, the, you, 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 the, the ghost thing is just something that we do to make it more crystal, but um, you know, what is the null hypothesis? Some of you will maybe not like hypothesis testing. It's just so critical that we talk about it. Um, I can tell you that um, if you interview for a data scientist position, hypothesis testing will most likely come up. Right, because it's so important. Right, how how did you you build a model? Okay, great. How do you know that it's accurate? How do you know that what you've done is different than what's being said? You know, for example, uh, when COVID hit in 2020, um, the thought from what was broadcast was that it was not going to be that bad. And I knew right away <laughs> that it was going to be very bad. And so, and you, you could have seen it, right? I remember being in the office doing napkin math saying it's at, you know, at a minimum uh, quadratic or tertiary. Uh, and so, and then you, you know what happens as it spreads. And so, you know, how do you go out and say that your model for some phenomena is, is different? So you have to use hypothesis testing. And in that case, the null hypothesis was that it was not going to be bad. And of course, we saw that it was very bad. So uh, it's the status quo, it's accepted, it uh, can only be rejected, and the burden of proof is on us. It was very easy to prove in COVID because we had, you know, so many people getting sick, so, and the uh, morbidity was high. Okay, so um, more on this. And uh, the alternative hypothesis tries to nullify the ghosts. So the null, right, null. And it's, a, it's strange why we say null, but I, I, I want you to think about null. Does any, does any, does, well, first, does anything jump out at you at the screen? Why do, you, why do you think they use null? Any ideas? Who saw the newest Ghostbuster movie? Anybody? It's actually, it's actually pretty good. Um, I, li I liked it at least. There's a scene. Uh, towards the end that I thought was uh, very, very strong. Let me see if I can make this uh, larger. But the idea here is um, that those of you, some of you may have realized, uh, noticed the null sign, right? And uh, yeah, and so that, that it's, it's interesting that the Ghostbusters chose to use the null sign with a ghost inside of it, right? So um, I, I say that the, the, a way to think of it is that the null of the situation, the null hypothesis is the ghost of the situation. And the ghost of the situation is the existing hypothesis. It's what's here, right? It came before us, it's the ghosts, the ghosts of what was happening. And they could be right, they could be right, they could be wrong, but it's one way to look at it. Okay. <clears throat> 
Um, it's important to note that uh, statistics and inferences are about populations, right? They're always approximate approximations. Um, however, um, and this is back to the quantum point, right? We're not using probabilities when we have the entire population. I want to know what, let's say, the uh, the the average GPA score is for every student at UTEP currently enrolled at UTEP. Okay, so I could build a model, and I could sample uh, very cleverly about uh, across UTEP, and and say, hey, this is you know what we think it's going to be, or I could just get everybody's uh, current GPA at UTEP and take the average. All right. So uh, again, yes. Yeah, so if we wanted to get age, we could do it. And of course, this is naive when the data set is small, but when the data set is gigantic that is an approach that can be taken, right? You have to think about, do you even need a model, right? Can we get there by just getting all the data? Opium, the opium epidemic, honestly, as much as I love AI and building models, that whole thing is solvable by managing the data appropriately. Just getting your hands on the ability to manage all those transactions coming in and being able to fork out that data and then in a timely manner, not being years, but maybe hours or days come up and say, hey, we're seeing blips that are too high or, um, <clears throat> and you can model that even normally, like, hey, you guys are two deviations out or you're beyond you know, a, a deviation out versus everybody else. So a lot of these problems are solved by just being able to get your hands around the amount of data involved. Okay. As much as I love building models, I'm just telling you. All right. So, okay. We're going to have some fun. Uh, th th who's seen Waldo? Anybody know who Waldo is? Nobody? Where's Waldo? Okay. All right. Good. Yes. So, um, uh, I, uh, we're going to do a quick survey. Uh, and by the way, I am a, who, who has done surveys? Who, where, who, are you guys fans of surveys? Yeah, uh, I can tell you that, uh, yeah, and I'm watching your responses in the chat. So every organization that I have worked in, the largest impact that I feel like I've made have come from surveys. You know, like, for example, when I was at FINRA, there was this huge uh exodus of staff everybody was leaving and they're like what are we going to do the management was having these big meetings about well, you know everybody's leaving what are we going to do we can't manage you know analyze everybody's data if everybody's leaving what's the story and so they're sitting there speculating and i said well why don't you ask the employees oh there's too many employees okay ask, ask a subset of them All right and and uh the point you have to make is always very interesting because um, it, it, you know, maybe maybe a large part of the solutions to most problems is empathy. You need to be able to get out of your own skin and see the problem from someone else's point of view. I wish Putin would do that. Maybe he has. He doesn't care. Okay, but uh, a, a lot of the solution gets comes together that way. So so what did I say to them? I said, look, you guys, as senior leaders have your view as to why people are leaving. But perhaps what you think is entirely different than what the engineers are thinking. And then you know you cite certain studies and they start thinking about it. And, and ultimately, uh, I said, before you start, this is key, before you start spending money, maybe you wanna do a survey. Before you start saying, hey, we need to increase comp, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a combination of things, right? Uh, so, okay, they agreed to do a survey. Surveys are cheap. You can use SurveyMonkey. There's all these tools you can put together. You have to be smart about how you sample, but you can get surveys done pretty quickly. All right. So we do a survey. I love surveys. Okay. And, it, and we ask, you have to be careful about the questions you ask. Uh, and, you know, we ask, like, what are the top uh, contributing factors to you, um, to your job, right? What do you view as most important? And through a series of questions, uh, we, we came down to what they valued the most. Right? And it's actually very interesting. Very, very interesting what, what, the, uh, 
what the responses were. Number one, anybody want to guess what number one was? This is this is for people, engineers working at uh, uh, FINRA as a nonprofit, right? Uh, but they're very, very talented engineers. And they're actually a not-for-profit. They're very, very talented engineers and their engineers were leaving. And um, so there's data scientists, big data engineers. <clears throat> and they ask, you know, what is the top thing you value in your job, specifically for like staying in the job? Anybody have an idea? No room for growth, that's one. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Uh, independence, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so it turned out, yeah, respect, uh, very interesting, Francis. Flexibility, let's get two more. This is actually very interesting. It might be the most important thing that you guys get today. Uh, in, in my opinion, because it always I, every time I, I, I talk about it, I forget it myself and I remember how important it is, right? So uh, personal work, salary, flexibility. Okay, yeah. So it turns out the number one thing was stability. They were very concerned with, you know, hey, we want steady work. Yeah, that was number one, right? And that makes sense. So it wasn't so much about, you know, how much money, it was more like the expected value, like what's the probability that I can keep this job, okay? And so, uh, so that, was, that was number one. Number two was uh, uh, the, the salary, right? So they did care about payroll, they did care about how much they were making. Uh, and so those are the, the big ones, right? You have to be able to pay the mortgage, you have to be able to support your family. Okay, so we get that out of the way. Right. So let's say you can't, let's say you can't tweak those knobs. There are certain things you can do, right? Like I'd love to pay everybody a million dollars, but the place would go bankrupt. Okay. I'd love to offer you a contract where you never get fired, but we couldn't do it. Right. It's not, it's not feasible. So what do you do? Okay. Number three was um, independence and like enjoyment of the work. You had people who had been doing quality control, quality assurance for years and wanted to work on machine learning AI, right? Even part-time, like, hey, you know, everybody else is doing this really exciting work. Can I please do a little bit of that? In fact, at Google, one day a week, they are uh, allowed to do whatever they want, right? It has to be somewhat job-related, but they have that independence to take on things. Those of you who are in academia, how much we value the ability to research what we want to research. I mean, we wouldn't probably do what we do if it wasn't for that, right? For those of you who have not experienced that, it is, it is like a life-changing event to be able to basically pick what you want to go after on a large percentage of your time, right? And, and, and so much so that most people take pay cuts to do it. It's very, very important. Um, okay, so we had, we had uh, the stability, we had the uh, payroll, we had the amount of money, we had the, let's say job flexibility with like what you're going after. And number four was appreciation. Feeling valued. Very good, William. Yeah. Appreciation. Let me tell you something. Appreciation is cheap. You can get it for nothing. You did a great job. That goes so far. So far. See somebody, if you see somebody today, or if you're talking to somebody today, Tell me you did a great job. You guys are all doing a great job. Fantastic, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm extraordinarily happy that you're all here and you're taking the time out of your data to learn more about data science and AI. So, and, and appreciation is, is it's, it's so meaningful and it goes so far. You can pay somebody less, but if they're appreciated, they'll stay. Pay somebody a whole lot of money and unappreciate them and uh, you know, make them feel uh, unimportant, they'll leave or emotional, right? So the, the appreciation um, factor is enormous, enormous. And something that you, please take that with you, right? It's important to, to have met people and your, your contacts are important, but it's also very important to realize how far appreciation goes. Compliments will get you almost anything, okay? And the last factor, which was one of my favorites, anybody wanna guess? It's, and, it's, and it's known by large corporations, right? So we've talked about money, all right? So we talked about job security, money, 
uh, independence on, on tasks you want to take, so academic freedom, uh, intellectual freedom. Uh, we've talked about appreciation, right? Anybody want to take a shot at the last one? Feeling happy. Time off, it's a pretty good one. I'll give you a hint, it's, uh, it's timely. It's timely. So it turns out the answer is Microsoft, Google, Amazon, they all know about it, food. Food is a major factor. I'm telling you now, if you appreciate your employees, your students, your, your coworkers, and you find a way to bring food, good food into the situation, you can probably pay them less and they'll be happy, right? Food goes along, it's a stimulant, all right? And so why is it at Microsoft, you never have to pay for food and the food is served, it's like five-star chefs, it's crazy operation. If any of you ever get a chance to go to Redmond, don't eat for a week and then go to Redmond and go to their cafeteria because the food is out of this world, all right? It's unbelievable. Google, same thing, out of this world, completely free. And so uh, these types of things are very important, but you know, management is not even thinking about that. Management says we gotta pay them more. We can't do it. There's no way to pay them more. So it's just regular attrition, no. No, no, no. If you can't pay them more, appreciate them. You know, buy pizza every other week or something. It goes a long way. You know, we had a specific complaint when one, one person said, you took away my uh, Coke machine and I've not been the same since. I want my Coke machine back. So, you, you know, you have to like, when you wait, and, and another thing about surveys, when the surveys are anonymous, that is gold. Anonymous surveys, gold. They change institutions if people are actually listening. The answer is out there, right? The, the true solution to improving the workplace or solving these crises is out there. You have to survey the right people, all right? So all about surveys. I'm telling you if, if you, if you take nothing else from what we've talked about here today, go back to your organizations and survey. Do a small survey and see what people are actually thinking. See, you know, if there's something that you're trying to solve, see how they would approach it. Right. And, and hopefully, you know, you glean something from that and make it anonymous. So you get the actual answers. There is nothing like it. You may not be ready for the answers. There's nothing like it. OK. All right. So in the spirit of that, OK, we're going to do a quick experiment. All right. Uh, John, how are we on time, by the way? Do you guys want to take a break? We can come back and do the experiment after the break, if you'd like. Yeah. How do you all? Uh, let's put it, let's put it to the chat. I will survey. Okay. So if we get more than 10 people in the chat that say break, uh, then we'll take a, let's say five to 10 minute break here. Yeah. So I'll open it up in the chat. Let's give it 60 seconds. You can respond if you'd like to take a break. Okay. okay. Two for break, break, break in 15 minutes, Francis, or, or. 15 minute break. Okay, so two, four, six. Almost there. 15 minute break. Okay, where are we? Let's if we uh let's get if we get one more break, then we'll go. All right. I think we're a week ago. I can't I can't just keep uh talking at you folks like this. You'll get bored. All right, where are we in time? So 1245, all right, let's take a break for uh, 15 minutes. We'll come back at one and then we'll perform an experiment. Yeah. And um, I'll be back shortly before that. I'm gonna go grab some uh, some food as well uh, because since we've been talking about it, see this is what happens. Uh, all right, so I'll see everybody back at one and then we'll get into uh, a survey. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Right, I'll see you guys soon. Yeah, thank you. Um, sorry, Prem, maybe I missed it, but uh, how do I get into that Slack channel, the Buds D20? I, it asks for a, uh, I have a number of Slack channels, but I can't get into this one. Uh, it asks for a password. Nana, are you still online? 
Yes, I will. I will put the link in there so you can just click on the link and then uh, set up. Okay. I told you he's the wizard. Yeah. Okay. Or, or do you send us all the link? Yeah, it, it was an email that we sent before, but I can I can post it in the chat. Okay. Yeah, it's, not, it's not working. It's the same problem. Asking password and thing. It's not working. Slack? No, I have the same problem. For which one? Uh, same Slack to going to Slack sign in. All right, let me let me repost it again, okay? Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, I'll see you guys in 15. It's going to be for you to find Waldo. So who's Waldo? Waldo, are you able to see my mouse pointer, by the way? Wave your hand if you can see my mouse pointer. Yeah. Kinda? Yeah, thank you, great. So Waldo is this gentleman over here with the white and red cap, peppermint shirt, glasses, and these um, problems are Waldo scattered in some audience. And when you find Waldo uh, to let us know, uh, just put in the chat that you found Waldo. So you can say found him. All right, uh, and what we'll do is we'll keep track of, let's say the first five people, uh, <clears throat> and uh, then we'll discuss the results. It's always very interesting. Okay, any questions? All right, so keep your, keep your uh, answers to the chat so that other folks can figure it out. We'll give it a maximum of 10 minutes so that we can keep things moving. And John, what, um, what time do we finish today? Uh, two o'clock. Two o'clock. Okay. So after this, um, we may move around a little bit outside of the slides because I also want to show you some modeling, right? Uh, and then we can also, we'll, we'll resume tomorrow. But okay. <clears throat> All right. So here we go. All right. I'm going to start it now. Uh, let me start the clock. By the way, uh, are, are any of you guys super survey people? I love surveys. Love, love, love survey people. So right, let's get the clock going. All right, I have my clock. Oh, you can't see the clock, but here's my clock. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna set the stopwatch. All right, so test it. Okay, so I'm resetting it. All right, and I'm now gonna get ready to unveil the Waldo. All right. Uh, if it's difficult, is, is it difficult to see the screen? Or, or is it clear so far? I'll, un I'll unveil the puzzle in a second, but from what you see so far, is it okay? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, good. All right, here we go. I'm starting the clock. All right. Waldo is somewhere in there. When you find him, uh, please put in the chat that you found him. Is, the, is it intelligible? Do you need me to make it larger somehow, or is it good? I think it's OK. Yes. Make it larger. Please. Yes, please. Larger. Make it larger? OK. All right, let me see if I can make it larger. OK, so I'm going to stop. And I'm going to bring this back to uh, a different screen. So let's go. I'm going to stop the presentation. Uh, all right, so let me do this. Does that stop it? Okay, yeah. So let me share this screen. Screen one. Screen two. Screen one. Okay, hold on. Share. Okay, so now do you guys see my screen here? I'm going to try to make it larger. Yes, yeah, we can. Okay, so I'm going to hide this. Actually, here. More. Basically, uh, frame, Dr. Prem, uh, if you put it in Google Slides, uh, it will come in Zoom position rather than PowerPoint in slide mode. But right now, it's okay. 
Okay, so let me see if I can hide this as well. Thank you, though. Um, so hide the floating meeting controls. Okay, and let's see if we can get this to be larger for you. I don't want to clip anything, though. And how do I... I think I can hide this. Okay. Is that better than what you had before? Not really. <laughs> okay. So the problem is, is if I zoom, it's busy, intentionally busy. Is it worse than it was before? Because I can put it back the other way. Zoom. Hmm? Okay. All right. Try, try with this. Yeah, and if um, if anything, I'll extend the time out. But okay, I put the clock back on. See if you can find Waldo. Yeah, someone has found him. Okay, Emmanuel and Jessica. How long ago? Okay, so that's three. Just now. Okay, good. Yeah. <clears throat> And let's wait for the first five. One, two. Okay, good. All right. So we have. Okay, so quite a few of our finding now. This is very interesting. Okay. So the first one was it looks that. Uh, let's see. Charlene. Are you, uh, are you here, Charlene? Uh, if you can tell us how you found him, if your audio is working, yeah, you see our good participants here. Uh, and let me go to the chat here. Grid approach. Uh, so you started at what top left and made your way across? going lower and lower. Okay, yeah, so that's how, okay, super analytical approach. Okay, so now let's see um, uh, Kamala, uh, how did you find Waldo? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, so I basically, I, I don't know, I did it in quadrants. So I looked at my brain and immediately went to the, the lowest left hand part of the picture. I don't know why. So uh -huh. I saw pink unicorn. Then I went to the upper quadrant before that. And then the next one, um, again, looking for red because I know he has stripes, red and white. Um, and then something told me to look where, I don't know where the red isn't so obvious. <laughs> I don't know. And then I saw like the sign used games and then he just happened to be there. Like, so I saw sell your used games here and then used games and I saw him with the little sign. How interesting. Thank you so much, yeah. Okay, so, so we had one grid approach, then you took a quadrant approach and then you took a, I think uh, they're trying to disinform me. So let me see where it would be not so obvious where he could be hidden, yeah. Uh, and then you ultimately I say that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. And then uh, Francis. Uh, how did you find him? Yeah. Francis. And then we'll go to uh, Emmanuel and Jessica Bray. So let me see if Francis is writing in the chat. Scanning from top uh, to left. So, okay. That's, that's two for grid. Okay. And then uh, Emmanuel, how did you find Waldo? I, I did the scanning as well from top from left, top but left. Then I had a filter on with him. Pay more attention to red stuff and try to find the face, especially the glasses. Okay. And then um, <clears throat> uh, let's look uh, after and Jessica Bray. Yeah, so for me, I kind of did a once over and then I was looking at the very populated areas because I figured he would be hidden among other people. 
And Jessica, can you explain your once over? So you, you went through a grid? Yeah, so just scanning from left to right in yeah. sort of different rows, I guess. And then after that, you said, let me look for densely populated areas because you may be hidden again. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Okay, uh, <clears throat> just because I find it so fascinating. Uh, uh, Krishna Kumar. Yeah, I did the same thing, you know, started from the left and kept going. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Christian died. Let me see if he's in the chat. Yeah. So you can let us know. And let's just do one more. Um, uh, let me see this. Uh, Kareen, Joan Franklin. I did the um, quadrant approach. So I checked the bottom left quadrant and then I kind of went to the right and then found them. How like, fascinating. Top right. Okay, so you went from, it's interesting. And I wonder if it's because of the, the pink jumps out. So your eye will go automatically tracks like the highest contrast or brightest uh, areas and images. So, <clears throat> and, and the author may have known that, right? So he may have dissuaded you by going into the bottom left and then obfuscating Waldo in the you know top right. Yeah. But yeah. Okay, very interesting. Does anybody have a totally different attack on how they found Waldo? Yeah, actually um, I used like a random approach, but I was mainly looking for a red and white stripe kind of pattern. Uh, can you, and so who, who was just speaking? Sorry. Oh, I'm Jyotirmai. Hi Jyotirmai. So can you explain the random approach? <clears throat> I was actually mainly focusing uh, on um, the pattern, like the red and white stripes to see. Um, so I was focusing on where I can see the red and white colors in the in the picture. So that's how I found him. Okay. Any other interesting attacks? Hello. Hi. Mm -hmm. Um, this is Isabel. So how I found him was I have to like, you know, in my mind section the population. Then by section I have to look to see if someone like Wado was there before I found him at the top right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Any other uh, any other attacks? I ruled out specific. Areas he could not be. Augustine, can you explain that? I ruled out specific areas he could not be. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What happened is I went by, if I can only rule out the potential areas given his features, then I can really move on to the next step. In other words, if I can reduce the error that I'm looking at, that I don't have to spend much time because if I go to that area, well, possibly he couldn't be there because his features just don't show up. So it is simply by ruling out, you know, the features that I'm looking for. If they're not there, then I'm not going to spend time with that area at all. So I have to move on to the next area. So by differentially ruling things out, I was able to say, boom, there it is, because essentially I cannot rule that out. Uh, now, but nonetheless, I still explore other areas. Fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So what is the high level feature that you use to roll, uh, rule out? The physical attributes were crucial to me. And then I was attending, again, sorry, I signed on this a little late because I was trying to get in there. So I didn't miss, the, I missed the kind of first part. But I look at the physical descriptions that he presented. So I was not sure about what, you know, for example, uh, the height, the weight, the size. And I actually said, so wait a minute, given what I have, what are the likely places this individual could be tracked? 
So those feature, features allow me to form a kind of hypothesis moving forward. Yeah. Uh, before we reveal where he is, does anybody else have a, thank you so much. Um, don't, don't worry if you can't find it. And the reason I say that is, first, it depends on your screens, right? There's so many variables at play here, right? We're doing this virtually. So it's not a scientific study, but it's, uh, you know, we're doing this partially because I want to, you know, encourage you to survey uh, for data for your models. Uh, and also, um, <clears throat> to uh, see how people think differently. I think it's wonderfully, I think it's, I think it's wonderful hearing different uh, attacks and, and strategies to these problems, right? And how, how we are wired similarly, but we're different, right? Um, does anybody else have uh, an interesting attack on how they arrived at Waldo? Uh, top to bottom, okay. Looking at the presentations where participants gather, okay. So I can also tell you having uh, experience in Waldo tends to help. Uh, you may not know why you're better at it, but you're better at it, okay. Uh, so uh, let's, let me see, left to right, top to bottom. Okay, yeah, so when I do it, uh, I've changed, okay? But I am informed about this now. But in the beginning when I would do it, um, like most of you, I would start top left uh, and work my way across in a typewriter fashion. And I would be looking for key features, you know, particularly the red and the white, okay? Now, the author is very smart because he's disguised all that red and white into one area. So as you scan, you'll quickly be like, oh, that's not there. You can, you can go past it, right? Now, once you've seen Waldo, it's like you can't unsee him, which is also very interesting, right? Your brain is translating things for you. Um, but I've since changed the way I approach it by looking for um, what the, uh, using some intuition from one of the attacks announced earlier, which is I look for where he's, uh, most likely to be hidden, right? So I would not look at the top left right away because it's too obvious, right? But you, you, only, you only see that after you look at these problems a certain amount of times. At least I only saw that. Some of you are much more intuitive and you were able to you know, figure out and decipher that it's, he's been hidden. Where would be an interesting place to hide him, right? So um, uh, let's see. So who... Who was it? Uh, I think it was the second answer. Uh, where is it? Was it uh, Charlene? How did you, Charlene? You found him first, right? You went through grid. Is that right? And I think uh, was it Kamala? You were you decided to well, Charlene? You found him first, so let's let you unveil it. So I think your audio may be off though. So let's see this. Zooming the screen in and then going area by area. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Um, so, Charlene, since you're, I think your audio may be off. Kamala, can you yeah. unveil where he is? Hi. Um, it's actually pronounced Camila. Um, Camila, I'm sorry. Sorry, I, I didn't get a chance during introductions because I had a lot of noise in the background, so I typed in my intro on the chat. But he is beside the sign that says used games, $99.99. Yeah. He's beside a stack of boxes that, yeah. Fantastic, right? He's actually holding up help and that too. So don't feel bad if you don't find him. Uh, when I conduct this experiment, uh, every time there are some folks where it takes 10 to 15 minutes. There are some people who get it in seconds uh, the fastest I've ever seen it done is like four seconds, but that person, um, I don't know, maybe has great eyesight and had done Waldo problems in their past, right? So maybe the brain gets better at deciphering the, the patterns. And, and again, the heuristics that we picked up that we know where they're probably going to be hidden. Okay, so all right, let me move to the next uh, Okay, 
So, okay, good. So here, the key thing I want, and we're just because we're running short on time, the key thing I want you to take from this is people are wonderfully different, right? And look at how the interaction led to different approaches. And I can tell you that um, this is the first time that, and I do this every term for the last, you know, 10 years now, okay? Uh, this is the first time I've heard, I deliberately looked for where he'd probably be hidden. Uh, like where would it make most sense to hide this person, okay? And it is also the first time I've heard that I wanted to rule things out, right? So every time I hear, you know, something new, right? So I, I've gained from this already, so thank you for that. Okay, <clears throat> so congratulations on finding Waldo. Again, everybody, see if I can zoom in here. And this is one of the, and admittedly, this is one of the hardest Waldos there is. There are incredibly difficult ones, and I searched a, uh, everywhere I could to find one that was very, very difficult, and you found it. So, um, okay, good. So let me minimize this. Or oh, I think I have to. Uh, I think I've made it too large now. Hold on. Yeah. Oh, here. All right. And I moved it. Okay, um, we can talk more about missing data. I want to, while I, while I have you, who is familiar with the target story um, regarding the target's ability to predict um, what a father and his daughter uh, were going through? Has anybody heard this story? Has everybody heard this story? Start there. No participants. <clears throat> Where are the participants? Uh, let me raise this. And then the video screens. Just a second. I'm starting to see the panel again for all of you. So participants. Oh, because I'm sharing the screen. That's why. All right. So let me do a new share, and let's do screen three. Um, which I think is, let's be sure. This should be screen three, share. All right, let me push this down. And where did the Zoom participants go? They're here. Okay, and then here. Okay, so can you guys see this? This is a, a page from the New York Times. You all see this? I have it in dark mode, but let me. Let me change this out. Uh, and I don't know where your, I don't know why I can't see your, let me close this and then open this again. All right, so the chat, participants, I lost your video screen, so I don't see you. Let me see if I can pull that back. I think that's the video panel. Show the video panel. There you are. Okay, good. So now let's pull you over here so I can see you guys. All right, um, I just have to make it smaller, just a sec. This way. And if you can see the uh, New York Times article, just wave your hand to the, well, wave any hand you'd like, yeah. Okay, good, thank you. And I'll move this panel out of the way so we can go forward here. Okay, so, um, I'll give you, uh, I'll post this in the, um, let me take off the dark reader. I'll let you guys vote on it too. You can, we can see this in, um, light or we can see this in brace now. Okay. So do you prefer that or do you prefer the dark? What do you think? I think I think it's okay. This is good, William. Yes, please. On my okay. side. Okay. 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 I, I don't know about the other. Right. So I'll uh, let me post this in the chat for you as well. Okay. So um, the uh, let me give you a backdrop. Okay. So what happens? This is back in 2010 is when I think the incident actually happened, and it was published in the New York Times. 
uh, on Feb 16th, 2012. And it is one of the best articles uh, I've ever read about data science and it's older. The techniques used are not even AI te techniques. They're all statistical techniques, but they're that effective, okay? And so here's what happens. It's uh, a father and his daughter uh, walk into Target. And the father says, uh, I want to see the manager. He's very upset, fuming hot. Okay? The daughter is, you know, I think 16 years old. She's very, she's embarrassed by the whole situation. Um, and the father says, I want to see the manager. Okay, so fine. Uh, store attendant goes and gets the manager. Manager comes out, says, you know, how can I help you? And the father says, I received an ad for um, my, you know, my daughter got some advertising for like cribs and baby clothes, right? And, um, you know, I, and I'm, you know, furious, like, are you trying to persuade her to, you know, get pregnant? She's only, a, she's a minor. What is going on here? Right? And, and the father's irate. Okay. So, uh, the manager says, sir, you know, that's done by corporate. Uh, we don't set the, the, the ads up or, uh, but I can inquire to corporate as to why this has happened. And I'm, you know, very sorry. And the father's disgruntled. And he's, he says, you know, you guys are irresponsible. He storms out of the, the, the store. And, um, uh, you know, again, the daughter is extremely, uh, um, you know, embarrassed by the situation and they leave. Okay, so a couple of weeks go by and the manager calls the father and says, you know, sir, I've uh, had a chance to look into this and uh, it's set by corporate. And what we do is we look at statistics of people's buying patterns and are able to figure out, um, you know, what, what uh, their situations might be, right? And the, before he goes in to elaborate, the father says, let me stop you right there. It seems that there were some things that I was unaware of and that um, Target effectively predicted that my daughter was pregnant um, before I found out that she was in fact pregnant, right? So, you know, he apologizes to um, the store manager uh, and the store manager is like, okay, this is even odder than it was to begin with, okay? Uh, but they, they move on and he realizes that Target's uh, predictive power is uh, very, very sharp when the, the story ends. And so then the article goes on to talk about uh, how it is that Target was able to pull this off. And before I go any further, let me just put this in the chat. But uh, who's heard this story before? Any of you? Yeah, uh, William, you have? Yeah. Um, you can just put, yeah, put it in the chat if you have. Yeah, yeah you have. Okay. Here's the article link. Okay. So, there are several extraordinarily important points in this article. Uh, the first thing is they did a lot of research uh, in psychology and human behavior and mice studies in order to figure out what it is to get people to, to figure out how to persuade people to figure out how to advertise like you have to figure you have to unpack how the human mind works so that your advertising and your your uh, inventory and the way that you present this stuff is more appealing than someone else so that you achieve more sales okay so they did a lot of research and what they found is that it's not so much it's not so much how you advertise, but it's more how you can manipulate the, uh, the patients or the clients. So what they found is that first, most of the 40% of the time, this is an approximation, but 40% of the time, human beings are functioning on habits. We're doing things that are subconscious, but are effective, right? Like we're not thinking about, you know, deeply about what's happening. 
we're just sort of going through the motion, motions. And your mind is wired to do that, right? The, the, the brain has a whole system to, to govern you and take you through habitual processes so that you can focus on what's really important. Okay, great, priority systems. So what they do is they target the habitual processes within you to get you to do what they want, right? So let me give you an example. How many of you, uh, and you can put it in the chat, actually click on internet advertising? I have never clicked on one of those ads. And ads have been here for decades. I've never clicked on one of those ads. Now, TikTok, I don't know what is going on with TikTok, but have you noticed that TikTok's ads are like, at least to me, are, are somewhat compelling. I'm like, this is, these are, this is amazing. Like, what is this thing? Okay. Now, is it that, is it that it's amazing or is it that I'm being conditioned to think it's amazing? And the other point of this is none of us, let's say the majority of us are not clicking on internet ads. Yet internet ads are what fund businesses. So why do businesses spend money, enormous amounts of money on internet ads when no one's clicking them? I don't even read them. I actively try to avoid them. Does any, do any of you try to read the internet advertising? Like we try to, you know, I've tried to minimize the screen so you don't even have to see it, All right? So the question then is why do they do it? And the reason they do it is because even though there's two things. One, you may stumble upon it as you're trying to learn something and it'll, it'll be absorbed by your mind. And enough of those stumbles will lead to associations in your mind that change the way you think about things. And we think by association. I say red, maybe you think about a stop sign. I say, I say red, maybe you think about blood, right? But these associations are there, that's what's going on. And if they can get enough of those ads into your mind, the associations will start to form. You'll start to think about Walmart or maybe you'll think about Target. They put red out, you might think about Target just because Target's colors are red, right? So that's the first one, you may stumble upon it. The second one is even if you are not actively reading it and trying to avoid the ads, which I do, that does not mean your brain didn't see it, right? I mean, your brain assimilated what was on the screen, it absorbed it. And subconsciously those images and those colors and the numbers and the ad that was there are within you. You've just minimized it, it's lower priority, but it is there, right? There's an enormous amount of information that we take in and it gets processed, some of which at lower levels, some of which is subconscious. And largely that subconscious advertising is enough to get people to do what, the advertisers want by this product. So the article goes on to say that uh, we did study to see what it is that people want, but it, they learned that they could control what it is that you want through advertising. You know, why, why did I choose to wear blue today? I don't know. I mean, for me, it was what was the clean shirt I had in, in, in the closet, but it, if I had another option, I may have chose it for some reason. Why? Right? The stimulus is around us impact us. So it's it's one thing. You remember uh, fans of the Matrix? I've seen the last one. It was not so great. Sorry. But the first one, it's very interesting when he's talking to the Oracle. Right? And he, he, uh, she says, don't worry about it. And he breaks a vase or something. Okay? And, and uh, he says, how did you know I was going to break the vase? And she says, what's really gonna bake your noodle is, would you have broke it had I not said something about it? Right? So um, take, a, take a look at this article. And if you think that things aren't predictable, I'm telling you human beings are predictable. We're state of the art. But if you look at phenomena and how we move, the patterns are you know, undeniable. And uh, I noticed that when we started looking at COVID data and when we started looking at uh, drug data and the patterns amongst people are shocking, right? Those of you who are psychologists or in the field of medicine, you can see it. Like 
the, the responses and the behaviors are repetitive, right? even if not predictable, repetitive. Okay, so take a look at that, right? We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Where are we in time? Sorry. Okay, 136. Uh, let's go back to the slides quickly. And let me share. Oh, sorry. There's some stuff in the chats. I don't because they subconscious position the product in your head. So when you see it in person enough, it convinces you to at least inquire about it. That's right. Yeah. So um, that is correct. Yeah. I so much now, in particularly the, those of you who have children who play games, like I always pay to get rid of the advertising just because I don't want the kids to get programmed. Right. And um, it's, 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 it's two days. So that's a new game. Pay us to get rid of the advertising. All right, new share, screen one, share. Let's move this out, let me put this back on. Okay. Um, all right, let's, let's uh, let me see if I can fire something up for you. I'm feeling adventurous since the world almost ended this morning. Uh, let's take a look at here. All right, so we'll post this for you in Code.io or Codeio, however you want to say it. Um, but let me close this. All right, so I will continue to pick up the slides, but since I have only so much time with you, I want to give you something tangible. Um, uh, as we as we go forward, and um, you know what what is what is it about data science and and Python? Right? A lot of you had mentioned Python uh, in your expectations, and let me hide this here. So a lot of you had mentioned Python in your expect uh, in your expectations, and the thing is, R is great. Right? There's you could get into why one language is better than the other. But the big thing about Python to me is Jupyter. How many of you have used Jupyter? You can raise your hand or wave your hand, yeah. Jupyter is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Like before, if you were gonna pick up a language, you would have to spend so much time learning uh, about the IDE, right? The interactive development environment. So you know, we had things like Eclipse, I don't know if any, some of you use Eclipse, some uh, NetBeans and Visual Studio and PyCharm. There are all these things that you had for R Studio, right? There are all these tools that you had to get your head around. And Jupyter is wildly simple. It's a web page. You know, it's, it's astonishing. Like, you look at, like, they have this concept and they're called notebooks. I use something called Jupyter Lab. Um, you can use any variant you want, but if you ask me, the breakthrough that really kind of pushed Python forward was the merging of it in and in, in Jupyter, right? So, um, or IPython notebooks is what it was, and then it turned into Project Jupyter. And what's happened is, is instead of you having to download, I mean, we still install it, but now these things are available online through things like Collab. Um, and uh, yeah, so th things like Collab or AWS SageMaker. Uh, now you can load up this web page and just start writing Python inside of it. And as much as I love object oriented programming, it just allows you to write as you would in a notebook. That's, that's the concept behind it, right? So, so, and what happens is, is you can do things like imports and you just have, like I hit shift return to go, but you can just come in here and also hit run. And you can basically click these, you know, runs, and it executes these blocks, Lego blocks, if you will, of code for you uh, in in almost like a debug manner. So you know, when you're when you're writing software and things go wrong, uh, and and you have a major bug, or and it's too tricky to just solve with print statements, what we do is something called debugging. And debugging is we we set a point in the code and we we step through it line by line so that we can see what's happening within the software, okay? And 
Jupiter does that for you automatically because that's actually an excellent way to develop. So it's almost like you're debugging as we are going forward, right? As, as, you're, as you're writing. So like, for example, here, I'm going to read in a CSV file from this pandas library. And pandas, we'll talk more about this tomorrow as we step through the notebook, but um, pandas is a library for data analysis. Uh, and its central output is this uh, software object called a data frame, which is a, which is a table. But you have to, like, just this simple, this simple operation. So we import pandas. You can call the pandas library whatever you want. I call it PD, so I don't have to write pandas. But you could have just said pandas. And NumPy is for arrays, very, very fancy arrays with a whole bunch of uh, statistical uh, functions for them. And sklearn metrics, you'll see that when we look at um, uh, confusion matrices to evaluate these models. All of this comes tomorrow, I'll take you through it. Uh, and then we set some uh, options for these uh, data frames, right? So I want all the, the column widths and I want, I don't want you to truncate the column widths and I don't want you to truncate the columns either. And then you can just say pd.read and then give it the path to your CSV. So a lot of data is in CSVs. And the, if you just say p, which is the last, uh, which is the last variable in a cell, it will output uh, a shortened version. Well, I've said don't truncate. So we'll output the entire table uh, in the notebook for you. Now, just doing this, Reading a CSV file and getting a visual view of it with highlighting in Java is a couple of days of work, right? Reading the CSV file, no problem. But to get a visualization like this where you could call, let's say you're talking to the domain expert uh, in, in the, uh, of the CSV file. Let's say it's family medicine, or in this case, it's like this could be patient data. In this case, it happens to be basketball data for the basketball fans in the Lima very large Kyrie Irving fan. And so uh, when he moved to the Celtics, I started looking at their data, right? And, um, you know, I could call Kyrie over. He's not a data scientist. He's busy, you know, becoming the best ball handler we've ever seen. And uh, I could say, hey, does this, you know, line up with what you're talking about? This is how I have imported this data. You know, what, what of these fields do you think are important? I'm trying to build a model for you know, what it is that you have to do in order to win. You know, do you have to um, score a lot of points or do you have to rebound better, right? And he would be able to come over and look at the screen and say, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think these three factors are important or this, or this is all I look at. And now you're having that conversation with the domain owners so that you can understand. Again, like when we were working with Arcos, the technical issues are not the problem. The real problem is trying to understand, from a data scientist point of view, is trying to understand the domain so we can figure out, well, where do we start? What is important? How do you make these decisions? How did you find Waldo, right? These are the things that are very important. Okay, so Python and Jupyter allow you to do that right here, right? It's, it's, it's seamless. And it, I think it is that that really pushed them forward. Now. Uh, let me give you uh, an example of, well, since we have it here, okay. So you have this data, and um, what happened is I looked at the first, what is this, 36? 33, uh, starting at zero, so 34. 34 games, uh, and I think this is the 2019 season. And I wanted to know if there was a way to predict uh, if the Celtics would win based on certain factors, right? So, and, and I, I thought about that because when I, when I saw basketball players, and you see it in all sports, uh, they'll be giving a post-game conference and they'll say, um, okay, you know, what happened tonight? The, the reporters will ask them what happened. And the maybe more analytical players will look at the stat sheet and say, well, you know, they out-rebounded us 20 to 10 in, in the fourth quarter. So there's no way we could win. Right? And so they, they, they point at these things, but obviously it's a combination of factors. So I said, you know, is there a way to automate that? Is there a way to look at this, this data, these, these factors that are tracked in games and predict if they will win or lose, right? And if you look at this, 
it's already, here's the thing. Human beings are state of the art. We are state of the art. But our pattern, some of you may be able to find it, okay? But our pattern matching on data of this size, and this is not even big data, we're talking about 34 rows, is already a problem. There's too many combinations. You could say, well, okay, you, when you score less than 100 points, you lose. Well, does that hold up? So, and that's just one variable. So what do you do? So, okay, you lost, you won, you won, you lost, you won, you won, you won, you won, you lost at 100, and it was above 100. So that doesn't hold, okay? So then you start saying, well, do we put our best offensive players on the field? Uh, it depends. Maybe it depends on what happens if it's Philadelphia, okay? But what if you were trying to find it in general, no matter what happens, what are the things you have to focus on? So that you as a coach or the general manager can say, this is where the team needs to focus its efforts. When we go into this next game, you guys need to do X, Y, and Z so that you always win. And if you don't, this is what's going to happen. Can it be done? Everybody with me? Kind of just wave your hands if you're with me. Yeah? Okay, good. Great. So, so can it be done? And it turns out that it can be done. All right? And, and, and how would you do it? We would step through one way to do it. The, the, some of you may have a semantic way to do it, okay? But the grid way to do it is you would walk through the combinations of each of these columns with the wins and the losses and see if you could discern a pattern. It's okay, you can't say it's just when you are less than 100 points. It may be if you're less than 100 points and you got out rebounded or you shot a certain percentage from the three point line. Right. So what, what are those factors? How do you figure? And, and the con now listen, this is not even a big data set. And the combinations are overwhelming. Right. Human beings will get crushed by this. So it turns out and we will get more into it uh, and you'll see it in depth in further lectures uh, that there are ways to completely. Automatically have the machines look at this data and discern the properties of whether or not you will win or lose given these factors. And I'll just, I'll take you to it uh, so that you can see it because I, I want you to, to see the predictive power of all this stuff, right? Like I, I can, can continue to give you slides but I just feel like the audience is too educated. And so I want you to see something tangible, right? So um, although this is an intro, I think you all are ready for it, right? There's a very, very sophisticated audience. Okay, so, so I'll take you through more of this as we go through, but essentially we take all these features, columns, features are nothing but columns, right? And we say, hey, I, I'm I wanna know when someone wins or loses, so that's what I'm gonna predict, okay? And uh, I'm gonna feed you this data, right? These are the X data points. So I'm gonna feed you the, the, how many points you scored, field goals made, field goal percentage, your three-point shooting, your free throw shooting. Everybody makes noise about free throws. It's real. Uh, your rebounding assists, steals, blocks, turnovers, okay? And we can get more factors, but I'm just going to send you this. And I want to know if we can make sense of it, okay? And so we send all that through, and there is an algorithm called uh, decision tree algorithm. Who's used decision trees? Wave your hands if you've used decision trees. Yeah, decision trees are incredibly useful and incredibly uh, uh, not used enough because everybody is talking about uh, neural networks and everybody is talking about like random forests, but random forests are essentially decision trees. They're just, you know, groups of decision trees. Uh, but you hear a lot about deep learning. You hear a lot about regression, but decision trees they're sort of the lost art. And what they do is that just like we said, they step through every combination and they find these patterns and they take some optimization, optimization steps to figure out which columns to target first so that the algorithm is efficient, right? And so by, by doing that, by walking the columns and the combinations uh, and computing something called entropy, which we'll talk about, uh, they are able to discern, let me take you to, um, this is one of them, but I'll take you to the final one, right? Because we, we do it a couple of times. So remember I talked about cross-validation. The answers are gonna depend on where you train test split. So we run it multiple ways, okay? So 
let me just, since we're running close on time, let me take you to the last one. I think this is, okay. All right, so this is the final model of the Celtics data, all right? And I'll do my best to explain like the terminology uh, so that it makes sense, right? So what did the model find? What did it find? The model found that if, and left is always true, okay? So it reads as when this condition is true, we go to the left. And when this condition is false, we go to the right, okay? So what happened? Every time you scored less than 98 points, you lost, all right? Every time that happened, let's go, let's go check it. Hopefully I have the orders right, right? So, <clears throat> so this is a sample loss, loss, all right? So remember we picked the number, I said a hundred, all right? And, and a coach might say a hundred, but it's not a hundred, it's actually 98. Okay, so, and this is on a, a, a small set of data, okay? So it found that every time you score less than or equal to 98 points, you lose. So no matter what, no matter who the opponent is, you lose. So you have to score more than 98 points, okay? So I, as a coach, am going to say, I need players who can score more than 98 points, right? And I know who, how, what the averages are. I know who is likely to score well against certain mass matchups. So I'm going to do what I can to try to get to 100, 90, 99 to 100, like first thing, okay? Then they said, all right, so that's the case. We can tell you straight away what happens if you score less than 98 points, it's a loss. So what else can we find, all right? If you did not score less than 98 points, right? So uh, if you did score more, that does not mean you automatically win. Okay, so if you score less than 98, it's a loss. 100 on 100. You score less than 98 points, it's a loss. All right? But if you score more than 98 points, so 99 points, it's still up in the air. All right? It's still up in the air. So what did they found? They found that if personal, the, what the model find? If personal fouls is less than 15, all right, so you scored a lot of points. Say you scored 100 points, okay? And your personal fouls is less than 15, you lose. And by the way, you'll, we'll get more into it. The order of this decision tree, the variables that come first are important because they are the best predictors. The points was the most certain, which is why we present it first. It breaks the classes up the most, right? You'd ideally like, you don't want the tree to be wide. You want it to be clean and like tight with wins and losses. The complexity will be too much for human beings to understand otherwise. You'll see some examples. Okay, so what does that mean? So you scored a lot of points, but the personal fouls were low, let's say higher low. Let's say you only have 15 um, personal fouls. So that implies that when you score a lot of points, but you don't play defense. Because when you play defense hard, you tend to foul, right? You don't play any defense, there's no fouls, okay? But you play a lot of defense, you play very hard, you tend to foul. So if you play a lot of offense, but you don't play a lot of defense, you're still gonna lose, okay? Now you have to think about how wild this is. Imagine that uh, you know, you're the coach and you're in the fourth quarter and you only have five personal fouls, okay? you would have to tell the team, start fouling people, play harder defense, right? Uh, and, the, and, the, and the teammates are gonna be like, what is wrong with this coach? There's a guy in the Toronto Raptors, they, I forget his name, <sighs> someone remind me, but they say he's a mad scientist because he's always looking at these combinations, but the math is real. If you score more than 98 points and you have less than 15 personal fouls, you lose, 100 on 100. That's another thing about decision trees. It, there are many combinations. There's something called association rules, which we'll talk about, which will give you all the combinations, but and, and they give you combinations at different confidences. So for example, maybe 85% of the time that you score more than 98 points, you win, okay? But decision trees, and that's why they call them decision trees. Decision trees are 100 on 100, right? 
every time this happened, it is 100% with this following, okay? So there's no, you know, X percentage, it is 100, okay? So, all right, so let's keep going. So you don't play a lot of offense. You play a lot of offense. You don't play that much defense, you lose, okay? The next thing is, so now let's say you played good offense, you scored over 100 points, over 98 points, and you fouled the other team enough, all right? It's still not uh, certain what's going to happen. Now it depends on how many blocks you get. Okay, so uh, SKLearn treats this as a um, uh, as a float, but it's actually uh, less than or equal to two. Right. So if you have less than two blocks in the game, you lose. Even if you score well and you foul the other team furiously. Okay. If you don't get two blocks, you lose, which means that you not only have to play defense, but you have to play it well. You have to block some shots. Two is not even that many, right? Okay, so if you don't get the blocks, you lose. All right, great. Then what happens? Okay, you did all that, right? So you, you've, I, we're almost there. So you, uh, you scored a lot of points, you played good defense, you blocked some shots. Okay, then if the personal fouls and this is, look at this, it's come back to the same variable. We have personal fouls up here, right? If personal fouls is less than 24.5, so less than 24, so you're greater than 15, right? And less than uh, 24, less than or equal to 24, you win. All right, so what does that mean? You can't just foul them indefinitely. You have to score a lot of points, yes. You have to play good defense. You got to get a couple of blocks, two blocks, and you can't, foul them indefinitely, you got to foul them judiciously, you win 100 on 100, right? And um, yeah, let's see if I can walk this. And then so uh, so if you do that, great. But if you don't score, if you, if you foul more than that, it's still a chance, okay? Yeah, let's say you went crazy and you had 30 fouls, 30 personal fouls, then it's going to come down to how well you shot, right? So if the field goal attempts is less than or equal to 92, right? So how many shots were taken overall? Then uh, we come this way. And if it's less, if it's greater than 92, which means you took a lot of shots, you win, right? And we can continue to go. I feel like we're running out of time here. Let me finish it. And then offensive rebounding. So again, if you did not take that many shots, it's going to come down to offensive rebounding. And if you had a very, if you had not that many rebounds, you lose. Even if you scored well, even if you defended well, even if you uh, uh, block some shots, if you don't get offensive rebounds, um, you're going to lose. And if you do get offensive rebounds that are greater than nine, so 10 or higher, you win. Now, the thing I want you to see from this is, and we'll wrap up here, those combinations of things that are infallible, 100 on 100 throughout this small data set are impossible for humans to find. Like we would never find that pattern, but the machines can find it very, very quickly. And this is a simple example with a few inputs and a single output of win or loss. But the decision trees can actually target multiple variables. We wanna know not only did you win or lose, but ticket sales, right? So you, the owner cares about ticket sales. He may not even care if he wins or loses, okay? So uh, more to come on this, we'll post all this. Uh, and I'll turn it over to John. And if you have any questions, we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you, everybody. John, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. I think he's muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think you're muted, John. Oh, I'm muted. Oh, okay, yeah, so, sorry about that. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so thank you again, Professor Prem, for an excellent presentation. As usual, you are always on top of uh, this thing. So we thank you so thank much. You. And again, uh, for those of you who are new, this first day presentation is just to give you an overview of data science, and that is what uh, Prem uh, has done. If you are not familiar, you are a beginner with Python week two and week three, that will start with the uh, uh, introduction to Python. So I uh, hope uh, you don't get uh, lost. I mean, if you are lost for on, on Python, that is fine. Python will be 
covered from week uh, two and three. So again, let's show up our appreciation to our Prem and then we'll have him again tomorrow, same time, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard uh, Time. So thank you again, all, all of you for coming. And then we we'll see you uh, tomorrow. Again, if you haven't signed up, try to do so, especially if you want the certificate of uh, completion, you have to attend at least six, uh, six out of the eight modules to get that uh, certificate. So if you haven't signed up, you want to do so now. Thank you again. Where would this be posted? Uh, uh, what? Where will this class material be posted? Uh, yes, the recordings will be posted. If you check Slack, there will be a link to uh, YouTube's uh, site that has the, uh, all the recordings. And then also you find the materials in GitHub. Again, I think all that information, you should find that in Slack. Or if you have any questions, post it in Slack and then you'll be directed to the appropriate site. Yeah. Any any questions? And uh, William, any yeah, you so, want to add? Yeah, I'm sure. Ibe, uh, Ile, uh, uh, Ile, the my other colleague uh, who uh, who be teaching the uh, intro Python class. Uh, I I'm not sure, but would there be office hours? Uh, and if so, uh, what times <laughs> and days? Or that would that would also be made available on on. Uh, on the, how, how do you call it, on the chat group, right? Yeah, I think the, the TAs, I mean, based on the availability, if you post the availability of the TA that will be available from this time to this oh, okay. time, again, okay. and Slack, then, then the yes. participants will know and then uh, they and will then uh, participate. come okay. up. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. Yeah, thanks. All right, any other question? Okay, so if there are no further questions, thank you again, and then you were able to stay together all these three hours. Uh, that's this surface on encouragement. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. everybody. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.